So there you ask if I uh, help him a little bit. He kind of tried to do that. I know him Dutch for a long time. Anyway, Mr. Bedford, he's the president and founder of Washington Research Corporation. He, he was originally from Colorado, which is a nice place we visited there. Uh, but when he married, he started raising his family here in Utah because he was also in the Air Force, didn't tell you that. He retired from, uh, from civil service at Taylor Air Force Base back in 1997 where uh, he became interested in physics uh, through the work of uh, Dewey B. Larson, which is kind of interesting. And Doug's an interesting person. He's done a lot of things, a lot of neat things, a lot of stuff with the internet he didn't want to share with people, but he's really brilliant with uh, hardware, computers, networks. Don't say that with these young kids. Well, <laughs> they're right too, so that's cool. Anyway, uh, circles around the end. Doug and his wife Barbara are graduates of uh, BYU and the parents of uh, six children and 13 grandchildren, and one more on the way, I think. He's also a member of past, past president of the International Society for Unified Science, and with that, I'll present that funny to you. Okay. Well, thank you, Dave. Uh, I want to uh, thank everybody for coming out. I, uh, just a second, let me try to get this. Okay, well, thanks everybody for coming out. Really, we, uh, as Dave said, this is the the uh, Larson, what we call the Larson Research Center. Dewey P. Larson, it, that it's named after, was uh, an, an engineer from Portland, and uh, back in the 20s, he's passed away now. But in those days, he uh, he um, was uh, at the university, what's now the University of Oregon, and uh, Linus Pauling was his. With, he went to school with them, they were classmates, and so on. But uh, Linus Pauling, of course, went on in physics and won the Nobel Prize. And uh, Dewey Larson uh, had to take care of his family, so so he ended up uh, being what they call a. Uh, uh, come on in, guy. Take a take a brochure there too. Um, he ended up being what they uh, call an, an independent investigator. All right, but a lot of of professional physicists call independent investigators uh, cranks and crackpots because they come up with all these crazy things. But uh, they a lot of times come up with things that are that are quite astounding. And so tonight uh, I am here to try to explain something new to you in physics, but to show you how uh, it developed uh, or develops really uh, uh, following string theory in a way. Now we're going to see a lot about string theory tonight. But what we're going to do, this is the inaugural lecture of a uh, series for at least six months that we'll be doing each Tuesday night. All right. First Tuesday. Uh, what did I say? Each Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah. First Tuesday each month. Thank you, Larry. <coughs> and, uh, and and it's in, in this first lecture is on the coming revolution in, in fundamental physics. Uh, the title of which is taken from uh, David Gross's uh, presentation. He's given this all over the world, uh, which he calls our, uh, he calls the coming revolution in fundamental physics. And uh, any of you seen that? No, nobody has seen seen it. It's on the internet, so I thought maybe there's a chance that some of you had seen it. So a lot of the slides I'm, I'm going to uh, use are, are taken directly from his presentation. Of course, I couldn't. It's very long, so I couldn't take it all. I, will, I can only hit the highlights, um, and I'll do that. Uh, but uh, it really comes down to what is string theory. His idea is that the coming revolution that we're looking at is is uh, really based on string theory. He has, he's probably the leading uh, string theorist uh, in the world. He recently received the uh, Nobel Prize along with a couple of other colleagues. That uh, for, not for string theory research, but for work in what's called QCD. You know what? Anybody know what quantum chrome, chromodynamics is? Okay. Well, I'm just trying to get a feel for where we're at. Now, I'm not a scientist, as I said. I'm more like Dewey Larson was, uh, an independent investigator. Uh, but what I've done is I've organized this and named it after him, the Dewey B. Larson Memorial Research Center. It's just right here, local. And. Uh, the idea is, is that 
we're going to take his ideas and develop them as far as we can, but to raise money in order to hire people who are physicists, all right, who that have the PhDs, the mathematicians that have the degrees. And uh, then when that happens, I'll kind of recede in the background and put on a more of a management hat at that point. But a crucial part of that is to have young people involved. So that's why I talk to McConkie and to uh, uh, Banks and to Fish and some of the others that are physics teachers at the local high schools to try to get you guys involved, all right? So I'm really not sure how much you understand of this, uh, but I'm, hope I'm hoping you're really interested in it. And we'll see what happens. Now, uh, you probably understand that physics really began as a science with Newton when he came uh, with, up with his laws of motion and the, and the Principia Mathematica and, of course, the calculus and so on. And, and, and he did more than, than just the falling apple thing that, that we normally think of. He actually established uh, a program of research based on this uh, F equals MA formula here that enabled uh, the uh, encapsulation of the laws of motion uh, in a mathematical form that, it, that then w were the, then the idea was that, that uh, they could describe nature as a few interactions among a few particles. See, that was the idea uh, to get down to the ultimate and uh, using calculus and the idea of the limit and differentiating and integrating and so on. So we have these concepts of force and velocity and position and mass and energy and momentum and acceleration developed. And it became very successful for 200 years. It got so good that this guy who was an old man when Einstein was a young man uh, said uh, and, and, and really reflected the thinking at the time uh, just before the turn of the century, there is nothing the turn of the 19th century to the 20th century. There's nothing new to be discovered in physics now, he said. Uh, all that remains is more and more precise measurement. <laughs> of course, that was about as big an understatement. Yeah, so, so then the big surprise was is that they made some discoveries, not just Einstein, but, but Maxwell came up with these equations that were just Amazing, showing how the magnetic and electrical fields work together, and, and uh, in electrodynamics, and Planck discovered that that hey, you know, uh, energy is not continuous; it's discrete. So he came up with the, the idea of the quantum, and and then Michelson and Morley experiment, of course, trying to find and detect the ether, discovered that that the speed of light was constant, no matter what the speed of the source of the light was. And of course, in Einstein uh, uh, discovered the photoelectric effect, for which he got the Nobel Prize. And Heisenberg discovered that there's a strange multiplication that uh, uh, they call non-commutative uh, multiplication. Come on in. Thanks. Take a flyer. Right. <laughs> this is my son-in-law, so I can play a little loose with him. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, so uh, so uh, Heisenberg discovered this that led to the uncertainty principle, and then later on, of course, Pauli with the exclusion principle, uh, and things started to come together. In the first 25 years of the 20th century, there was a literal revolution. There was actually two revolutions uh, uh, and, uh, that completely redid fundamental physics. So. Um, Lord Kelvin would have been really surprised. But uh, the first one you know about is general relativity, where uh, Einstein was able to combine the constant, the speed of light, and, and the Newton's constant of gravity, and come up with a new theory of gravity based on the equivalence principle, where mass and energy deform space, and the deformation of space then uh, causes uh, matter to move, and it's this interaction of matter in this dynamic relationship between matter and space-time, as they combine time and space together. And so that was phenomenal. And, uh, and then uh, the uh, development of quantum mechanics took off when Dirac 
was able to come up with the relativistic version of quantum mechanics. And that led to quantum field theory with Feynman and, and company, and, and eventually to the standard model, what we call the standard model today, which is the model of the theory of matter and radiation. So we have these two, the theory of matter and radiation in the standard model, and we have the, the uh, general relativity, uh, the theory of gravity. Well, Einstein wanted to unify these. He didn't like quantum mechanics. He thought there ought to be a unified field theory. And while everybody was all excited working in quantum mechanics, he he wasn't part of it anymore. And he was uh, kind of uh, thought of as sort of a somebody well past his prime. And he was there at Princeton in that house, up late at night with his equations and whatnot, trying to figure out this unified field theory. But he died, not being able to figure it out. And it wasn't until later when they discovered how schizophrenic, as John Baez puts it, these two theories are, that they realized that it was Einstein who was ahead of them, not the other way around. And so then the idea that came, it became important to find a way to unify this deeply schizophrenic uh, situation here where general relativity and the standard model just are totally incompatible. General relativity I idealizes reality without taking into account the quantum action, H, and, and of course it has a dynamic background, uh, uh, meaning that it, that it uh, makes up its own background, really. And it's a, a, a non-quantum geometric concept when you come down to it that, that really is a combination of the Newton's geometric, I mean, Newton's gravitational constant and, and the constant C. In the standard model, though, because gravity is so weak with particles, right, uh, compared to, see, I can, I can resist the, the, the gravitation of the whole Earth, you know, with just a little bit of effort, uh, because of the, of the, uh, of the uh, electromagnetic forces. And, and so they just really ignored it, ignored it. They really ignored uh, the gravitational constant using just, just quantum, uh, the uh, Planck's constant h and the uh, and the gravitation and the speed of light constant, all right, and and so like I said, this, this was all right until they got further down the road and they realized, hey, this is not going to work. So they had to come up with a way uh, uh, to unify the theories. The idea was is that uh, we shouldn't have, you know, uh, Stephen Hawking. What, what does he say about the about the standard model is ugly and ad hoc because you gotta add all these parameters, you know, the 20 or so free parameters, and it doesn't include gravity, and, and it never can include gravity if it, as long as it's a field theory, you see, and, and so on. So, so they realized that, but, but Planck early on realized that, hey, if you take these three constants, you can combine them and come up with something that some people call he called natural units, but some people call God constant, that, that it has a, a mass and a length and a time of what this has come to be called the Planck mass, the Planck length, and the Planck time, all right? But it's very, very small, and, uh, and, and, and the mass is huge, and the energy is huge, but the, but the, the space and time at that point are, are real small. So, so the idea was, well, if, if we could combine G and C and H and C and come up with these theories that we've got, maybe combining all three of them is where we need to go, right? To get the unified theory. So this is not how it developed, but people realized this idea of string theory was being used to work uh, some problems with QCD, quarks, ten. You can't observe quarks, isolated quarks. They, they, they think they're in there, but you can't observe them because th as they separate, the strength is not uh, one over r squared, getting weaker and weaker as, they, as the distance between them increases, and it actually gets stronger. It was called asymptotic freedom, and that's what uh, David Gross uh, received, uh, along with his colleagues, received the uh, Nobel Prize for here a few years ago when they were working with this because they came up with the quantum chromodynamics theory that explains how this asymptotic theory uh, works. But 
Before that, people were wondering, well, they dug up these old formulas and they were wondering if, you know, it's like a rubber band uh, uh, thing. But, you know, a rubber band, the more you stretch it, the, the tighter it pulls, you know, to pull it back together. And, and so they were, they were working on that. And when they worked at the equations, they realized that this, this Planck scale is where this would occur, all right? And they couldn't call it rubber band theory, so they called it string theory. <laughs> they didn't want to be laughed at. And so that's really how string theory uh, came about. It, it wasn't very successful, and it wasn't uh, uh, really thought of in terms of this, uh, this uh, train of uh, unification, uh, but, or this logical ex extension of physics until much later. But uh, it came on the scene and uh, was soon uh, to be done. Well, when they look at this, uni this Planck scale, this unification thing where string theory lives, uh, they would, they would, in those days they were trying to figure out how they could extrapolate these down. And they, you know, as the energy increases and the distance decreases, the strong nuclear theory or force gets weaker, and so does the weak nuclear force. But the electromagnetic grows stronger, and the gravitational force, you can think of it as a force, grows stronger. So at the unification point, they, they're unified. And, uh, but the problem is, of course, that's 10 to the 28 EV, which is just huge energy. And we're, we're right in here where this arrow is, and the LHC, which we'll talk about in that, is the new. How many know what the LHC is? Nobody? OK, it's, it's uh, this big machine being built. Uh, in CERN, uh, it was called CERN, it's on the border between Switzerland and France, and, and it's to collide hydron, hadrons together, the hadrons are protons and neutrons and so on, so they're going to collide these heavy particles, and it's got huge energy, but it, it can, can't even come close to this Planck scale, all right? But it's, uh, uh, what happened was is that uh, the uh, string theory uh, started to work with this guy named Schwartz, and he got some, some, uh, uh, made some progress. It's called a, 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 a cancellation of some anomalies that, that were plaguing him. That nobody wanted to work with string theory because of these anomalies. Well, he found out how they he, he canceled, and he he shared this. He was in the 80s. He shared this with Ben uh, a copy of, the, of his paper to this guy named Edward Witten, who uh, is real at Princeton is considered, you know, heir apparent to Einstein. He just like so brilliant, nobody can comprehend how brilliant this guy is. And uh, so he sent him a copy of the paper, and the guy was really interested. In, and uh, when he was interested, everybody else just followed, right? So <laughs> that's what they call the first revolution in string theory. And then this, uh, the, but it was in 26 dimensions. It required 26 dimensions, and it only worked with bosons, not fermions. So now how many know what a boson is as versus a fermion? Anybody? Do you, Larry? Okay. Uh, let me let me just try to explain it real fast. The boson has spin one, integer spin, so it's the only one we know about is really the photon, but there are other theoretical ones out here. And then you have all the fermions, and uh, and and they're associated with these forces. So so fermions are the particles. All right, they have one half uh, spin. And spin one half, they call it. And, and then, with uh, in the fermions, you've got you've got the uh, uh, leptons, which are the electrons and neutrinos, uh, and you've got the quarks. All right. So these are called all called fermions. And 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 the twenty six dimensional string theory that Ed Witten got all excited about. Oops, what happened? I did, I probably hit a button. Oh, you did. Uh, button. <coughs> Maybe the screen's <laughs> no, here. Uh, um, I might do that. Looks like it. Is it on the screen over there? No. I don't want to mess your screen up. Let's try something. Yeah, right there. There you go. Good. Thank you. Anyway, uh, We'll probably get way, way over time if I get into that. But this idea of 
you know, you can't have a theory that only works with half of the standard model. It has to work with all fermions as well as, as uh, bosons. So this supersymmetry discovery, they call it discovery, but it's theoretic. They, they, it's a mathematical discovery. They, they found that it would work uh, and reduce the dimensions from 26 to 10. All right? Uh, ten space, nine space and one time. Nine space and one time. You got three that we can observe, so that means six extra dimensions of space. And uh, but but it doubled the number of particles. So they like they had to call electrons selectrons. Each each uh, uh, photon had its photino. Each one had a partner. So you know it, it, if they do discover that there is something like that in reality, it's going to double the number of. Of uh, uh, particles in the particle zoo uh, that we have now, so there's quite a deal, and they're building this L LHC, this big, big, huge machine, cost billions of dollars there in what they call CERN uh, in France and Switzerland, and it's supposed to come online this year. Probably won't make it, but uh, it will early next year if not. And that is their big thing: to look for supersymmetry, because without supersymmetry, they don't have fermions, and they, they don't get exact unification here. These converge real close, but not exactly. So, so supersymmetry. So it's not going now. Okay, I got it. Good. Thank you. Okay. So anyway, looking at the the idea then of string theory. Uh, we start with the atom, we go to the proton with the um, uh, neutrons and protons. I guess that's, then these would be the quarks. I can't read that, it's pretty blurry. And then from, it's it's oh yeah, these are the protons and neutrons, or what we call the hadrons, huh? And, and then, and then the, the quarks and the electrons. All right, but then way down here, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters is where the, uh, Strings are supposed to reside. So 10 to the minus what? 30, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. I mean meters probably. Yeah, meters. That's five no, centimeters. centimeters. So it'd be 10 to the 35 <coughs> meters. But but thing is, is that uh, all the particles then are different harmonics. You see, of the same string. Uh, they can vibrate in different ways, and they have they found topologically ways that they can vibrate in these extra dimensions. And each vibration mode then is equal to a different particle. And pretty much they can come up with a standard model that way. So it's pretty exciting, except for this perplexing problem that there's really no way to identify any natural phenomena with this. They don't know what the phenomenon would be. Uh, you know, when we're talking about gravitational constant, we know what that's associated with there's a real observable uh, gravitational force involved. A speed of light, we know what that is. And we can play with it. We can even freeze it now and do all kinds of things with light. So, so that's that's understandable. And of course, the energy quantum the same way. That's uh, all that is observable. But this thing, what is that at the plug plane? Nobody knows. It's an ad hoc invention of the human mind, but it's really weird. It seems to work. But here's what Ed Widman, this is the guy that's like the Einstein apparent genius, he says in an article printed in Nature in 2005 called Unraveling String Theory. He says, Einstein understood the central concepts of general relativity years before he developed the detailed equations. By contrast, string theory has been discovered in bits and pieces. Over a period that has stretched for nearly four decades without anyone really understanding what was behind it. As a result, every bit that is unearthed comes as a surprise. We still don't know where all these ideas are coming from or heading to. <laughs> is that weird or what? And then David Gross himself, this is his chart, says we are still not sure what string there is. And so it's, he's comparing it here to the blind man trying to describe an elephant, each one in a different part. All right. Uh, so if that's the case, what is it that, that is about string theory, that, that it, these bits and pieces that, that make such a difference and keep people excited? Well, there's several of them. One of them, we'll cover some of them, but the
principal feature is this elimination of infinity. And if you study physics, you know uh, you will, when you have a, an electron, for instance, it's supposed to be a point particle, right? I mean, <laughs> what's a point? How thick is a point? It's not supposed to be. <laughs> it's supposed to be zero. But how can you have a zero point that has a charge? You see, there's this paradox. And 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 if you if it has a charge and it has some extent, then the charge has to be distributed along the surface, right? But pieces of that charge are all the same charge. If it's an electron, it's all negative. So they should be repelling one another. So they came up with this idea of Poincier. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Are you French speaking there? Well, no one will know the difference unless they speak French. Uh, Poincar uh, stresses, they call them, the little rubber bands holding these pieces together. It's the only way they can figure it out. That was way, way before string theory came along. But this, these infinities that are associated with zero d point particles are uh, extremely. Uh, enigmatic and often this paradox, whereas the strings are 2D vibrations. So they automatically don't have those problems. And then quantum gravity comes out. Uh, particles and strings include uh, a, a graviton. We, this one, uh, it's another boson up here. And it's just uh, something that, that the theory has to have. It just comes out of the theory. And, uh, and, and of course, quantum gravity is something that that they, you know, that's what they need. See, if you could, if you could explain gravity as a quantum, then, then uh, you would have a unified standard model, right? If there's some kind of a graviton as a boson in the standard model, uh, and, then, and, and of course there's something called a Higgs particle there that, that, that provides mass, but, but if you had those, then you would have a unified theory, see? And so that's what they're looking for. And so that's pretty exciting that, hey, if we do away with these point particles and use strings, we come up with this quantum gravity almost for free. And then the other thing is, is uh, what David Gross says, it is what it is. <laughs> and that means <coughs> that unlike the standard model that has all these free parameters that are added, it has no free parameters, essentially. So it is very, very rigid and drives you to conclusions, which is what is really good in a, in a theory. And it's like fragile, you can't modify it without destroying the whole thing. So that's really what you want in a physical theory. And you don't want something that will work with anything. Well, so here's what we got. Now here's what I was talking about with the standard quantum field theory, this QFT up here, is it, it, it's produced this standard model. All right, so we can go from ordinary matter to atoms, and the idea of a cloud of electrons around the nucleus, and the nucleus made up of protons and neutrons, and, uh, and those are made up of quarks, and there's three families of them, and you got the leptons and, uh, and the, uh, and the, and the, and the, the uh, quarks. And you got three families of quarks and three families of, of leptons, the, the uh, neutrinos and the, and the electrons. So, they don't know why those exist, but you've got the associated forces, electromagnetism explained by the exchange of photons. You got the weak uh, um, interaction that's responsible for radioactivity, and it has the W uh, plus and minus W bosons and the Z boson. They know all that, how that's supposed to work, and then they got the gluons for the strong uh, uh, theory with quantum field theory, but then QCE has come along, like I said, and, and, uh, and, and has a better theory about how those quarks stay together. But, but, but this has been very successful. They can calculate down to 11 decimal points, places, all right? Some of these, these values. So, so it's very, they've got something here, all right? Very successful. Uh, but then when they apply it, uh, uh, well, oh well, let me back up. And, but in order to do this, you had to have something to handle those infinities. It's called renormalization. So a lot of people considered it early on, although today it's pretty well accepted that it was like cheating. But, uh, but then when they apply this to cosmology and, uh, and use it in conjunction with 
Einstein's equations, which predict how the universe uh, expanded, the history of the universe from the Big Bang, uh, then they, they, ha they can get down so far, but not any further. See, they, they, they you know, these are ridiculous amounts, small amounts of time, but, but as the universe expanded rapidly in what they call inflation, they know, you know, at a certain point these formed, and then at a certain point 300,000 years later these formed, and then billions of years later there's these, and they see them all as a result of this big explosion, this big bang. But the problem is, is that their equations break down at the, at what the point of what they call the singularity, and you can't go any further. So the equation, it kind of, I mean, this infinity of these singularities uh, really mess up the, Fly in the ointment, if you will. <coughs> and so, where strings, string theory eliminates infinities, you think, wow, that'd be really great. Maybe we can, we can solve this problem. And again, it's, the problem is at this interaction point. Now, if, if, when strings move, it's because their strings are like a, you know, a, a tube instead of a point path like this that would have this infinity at the intersection. This is where an uh, electron and a, and a positron come together and then a photon it results when they combine. But, but that interaction point is the problem there, you see. Well, if you did that with, with uh, strings, this would be a tube because the string has some kind of dimension here, right? A closed string. And so you'd have two tubes come together, but if they did it like this, it would be a big problem, even worse problem than the particle intersection. But, but instead, they come together like this what they call the pants diagram. So as they come up here, they combine into a bigger string. And that works great. There's no infinities. There's no point that you can, that where the equations break down. So, so that's really uh, in, uh, interesting. And it actually helped solve this big theoretical problem they had with black holes. And the concept of black hole was that you, quantum mechanics didn't work. You lose information because uh, uh, of the laws of quantum mechanics. And, and Stephen Hawking was the one that, that really uh, was the proponent of this and, and insisting that, that it wasn't. But then when string theory came along, it solved this information conservation problem. And he finally had to admit here a few years ago that, yeah, you know, it, 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 it's, it is a unitary theory, what they call a unitary theory. It didn't use, lose unitary. So, so that was, that was a big plus uh, for string theory. That boosted it even more, right? And of course, but the biggest problem is this one here that we're talking about, that the singularity. If they could solve that, that would, that would be the real big deal. Because really, when you look at cosmology today, today, it's like the laboratory for physics theories, right? Because we're using what we discover in our physics theories to explain the universe, right? And the history of the universe. But we can't live with this in where the equations break down. We don't have it there. <laughs> we got the Big Bang and everything seems to follow after it, but we can't get past this barrier. Well, the big, the big uh, hope is, is that string theory will be able to solve that one like it did the black hole information loss.